Welcome to this intellectual feast we've prepared for you. I'm Paul Carice. I'm the director of this new academic unit at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. We're glad you could join us for this extraordinary set of scholars discussing what is ailing liberal democracy and the evergreen insights from the French political philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville that might help us to understand our current political and cultural moment uh, in America, but I suspect that we'll be talking about liberal democracy uh, elsewhere in the world. This is the fourth event in the school's 2018-2019 series entitled Polarization and Civil Disagreement, Addressing America's Civic Crisis. The series includes individual speaker events and interviews, dialogue and panel events, and in February we will have a two-day conference. The school co-sponsors the series uh, with two partners at ASU, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, just as we did with our series last year, our inaugural year. And we are happy to be collaborating with Arizona PBS on recording all of these events in the series, just as they did last year, to be aired locally on Channel 8 and then archived on the Arizona PBS website. To be, and uh, later to be shared with the National PBS Network. Videos of all of our events are, are also archived on our website, the Skettle website. Uh, please spread the word about the series on the campus and beyond. Nearly 4,000 people from the ASU and broader Phoenix communities came to our events last year. Uh, there's information outside um, on our events and again, go to our website. The aim of all of this is to provide a forum for civil disagreement and debate about important civic and intellectual issues. Uh, and it's great to see the turnout we have people from the ASU uh, community and the Phoenix community. The series itself is an expression of the core mission of the new school at ASU to restore the connection between liberal education and civic education. We do that in our coursework and then in uh, public events and efforts like this series. Now, because I have four distinguished scholars to introduce, I'm not going to say much more about the school, our curriculum, uh, our, our, our public programs, but uh, please do look at the website. And there's information, uh, again, available outside. See myself or other faculty members that are here if you have questions. Um, I, I will add one final note, though, uh, that an aim of what we do in the classroom and beyond is premised upon the hope that if we return to discussing some fundamental ideas and debates about human affairs and about America, that might provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. Now, there are two premises for the panel discussion we've organized uh, for this event in the series, and, and also a premise for the, the uh, discussion among the panel and, and with the audience um, at, at the end of the panel presentations. Uh, first, that liberal democracy is not in particularly good health in the 21st century in America and beyond. Uh, the rise of angry populism, questions about social cohesion, uh, issues about free speech, uh, the, the questions about immigration, in general, the declining legitimacy of our public institutions and our major professions. The second premise is that there may be wisdom about what's going on and what would be healthy for a liberal democracy, about causes and, and possible remedies for these uh, maladies, to be found in the political philosophy uh, produced nearly two centuries ago by Alexis de Tocqueville. Most Americans would probably know his, his first prominent work, uh, two-volume work, Democracy in America, published in 1835 and 1840. Um, most of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, both of the premises I've just offered might be wrong, um, but um, since I'm going big, I'll really go big and just note that um, a prominent distinguished scholar of political philosophy at Harvard uh, made this claim about um, democracy in America. He's also a friend of this new school at Arizona State University, stating that democracy in America is both the best book ever written about democracy and the best book ever written about America. So that could also be up for debate discussion today. Um, uh, I will give just a brief and inadequate uh, account of the careers of these two, of these four uh, scholars, not doing them justice. Um, and I'll uh, speak about them in, in the order that they will uh, speak today. Uh, Patrick Deneen is a professor of political science and holds the David Potenziani Memorial Chair of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He's also taught at Princeton University and Georgetown University. 
his teaching and publications address ancient political thought, American political thought, religion and politics, and literature and politics. His books include The Odyssey of Political Theory, Democratic Faith, Conserving America, and most recently, Why Liberalism Failed. And among other publications, he's co-edited a compilation of the writings of the scholar Wilson Carey McWilliams. Patrick frequently writes for journals of opinion in, in addition to this kind of scholarship, including First Things, The American Conservative, The Weekly Standard, Chronicle of Higher Education, and Commonweal. Speaking next is Joshua Mitchell, a professor of political theory at Georgetown University, where he has served as the chair of the government department. He's also served as associate dean of faculty at Georgetown University's program in Qatar. His experience in the Middle East also includes service as the acting chancellor of the American University of Iraq in northern Iraq in Suleimani. His research addresses the relationship between political thought and theology in the West. His books include Not by Reason Alone, Religion, History, and Identity in Early Modern Political Thought, The Fragility of Freedom, Tocqueville on Religion, Democracy, and the American Future, Plato's Fable on the Mortal Condition in Shadowy Times, and most recently, Tocqueville in Arabia, Dilemmas in the Democratic Age. Uh, then Paul Ray will speak. He is the Charles and Louise Lee Chair in the Western Heritage at Hillsdale College, where he is a professor of history. He's also taught at Yale University, Cornell University, Franklin and Marshall College, and the University of Tulsa. His most recent book is The Grand Strategy of Classical Sparta, The Persian Challenge. Some of his earlier books include Republics, Ancient and Modern, Classical Republicanism and the American Revolution, Montesquieu and the Logic of Liberty, and Soft Despotism, Democracy's Drift. Sub subtitle, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Tocqueville, and the Modern Prospect. He also writes on contemporary politics and culture for the website Ricochet. And speaking last but not least, Cheryl Welsh, senior lecturer and director of undergraduate studies in the government department at Harvard University. Her teaching and research in political theory addresses the history of political thought, especially 19th century France, liberal and democratic theory, and the history of human rights. Her books include Liberty and Utility, The French Ideologues and the Transformation of Liberalism, and also De Tocqueville. And she is the co-editor of Critical Issues in Social Theory, and the editor of a fine collection of essays on Tocqueville, which I used when I was teaching Tocqueville in India, uh, it had just come out, called The Cambridge Companion to Tocqueville. So each of the panelists will speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then in the second part of the program, I will come back onto the stage and pose some questions and try and generate discussion among the panelists. And then, as you can see, we have a microphone in the center aisle uh, for some questions from the audience. And after that, there will be a reception where we hope the discussion will continue. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Carice, uh, who's been a longtime friend, and it's, it's a delight to be here uh, at the um, ASU School for Civic Economic Thought and Leadership. This is like a kind of reunion of, of old and long-standing friends. Uh, uh, I'm starting to think of it as Notre Dame Southwest, and I think we should formalize this relationship uh, so that I can teach here every February to March. It would be, would be lovely. Let me jump right into the topic. Uh, it seems to me that one of the striking things about reading and rereading Tocqueville, and I do this regularly in teaching Tocqueville, I'm teaching him this semester to a group of juniors at Notre Dame, is that Tocqueville is among the first, it seems to me, in the borning age of democracy, of liberal democracy, to understand that there will be a natural tendency in a democratic age for people to separate into two main parties, and that those two parties would be the party of liberty and the party of equality. He understands this well, his famous uh, chapter, uh, chapter uh, from volume two, uh, part two, chapter one, which is entitled, Why a Democratic People Will Show a More Ardent Love of Equality Than for Freedom. He understands that democracy and the democratic peoples will incline to prefer equality over liberty, and that it's likely that the larger party will be the party of equality. This ardent love for equality, he puts it, 
will even lead to the point or the possibility of a democratic people to sacrifice liberty for the sake of equality. He concludes this chapter with a rather arresting line, and I quote, for equality of a, a democratic peoples have an ardent, insatiable, eternal, and invincible passion. They want equality and freedom, and if they cannot get it, they still want it in slavery. Now lines like this and this analysis about the ardent love of equality, even to the point of sacrificing liberty, points uh, is uh, part of, and indeed forms the core of what is an extended reflection on the part of Tocqueville throughout the great book, Democracy in America, on the dangers, the great dangers of this excessive love of democratic equality. And one sees this in some of his most famous passages, his discussion of the possibility of tyranny of the majority, that the ardent love of equality will lead in a way to a tyranny, not only a political tyranny of the majority, but to the, to the tyranny of public opinion over the thought, the very possibility of people thinking outside of the equal sort of uh, views of the many. And it also undergirds his argument, perhaps most famously in his concluding chapters, where he foresees the possibility of a rise of a new form of democratic despotism, a kind of overarching and encroaching statism that this love of equality will lead people to sacrifice their liberty to be taken care of by a kind of nanny state. But what's notable about his analysis, one that has been a favorite among conservatives, American conservatives in particular, uh, because of its condemnation of this love of equality for, uh, at the cost of liberty, is that Tocqueville does not propose as its remedy a form of what we could call liberal liberty. It does not propose as its solution to the excessive form of equality the embrace of the individual or the embrace of individual liberty as its uh, remedy. In other words, he does not propose the solution that we might think that we would find in the American political tradition itself, that tradition we can trace all the way back to our founding fathers and to the thinkers that in some ways lie behind the American founding, like John Locke, the assertion of individual liberty, the assertion of our individual rights, and the insistence that the structural limits on government may suffice. Indeed, I think we can valuably contrast Tocqueville on this score with two contemporaries that are concerned with the same threats that Tocqueville identifies, but arrive at very different conclusions and suggestions. These two thinkers, one of whom is British and one of whom is American, I think are widely viewed as having laid out some of the most attractive counterarguments to what uh, Tocqueville and these thinkers believed was the great threat of a, of a society and age of equality, of democratic equality. The first of these is John Stuart Mill, who in his book on liberty, published roughly around the same time that Tocqueville is himself writing, and who praised Tocqueville when he reviewed volume one of Democracy in America. In his book on liberty, he argued that in the face especially of overwhelming public opinion, the possibility of tyranny of the majority, that what was needed was a kind of assertive individuality, the throwing off of custom and the restraints of the past and tradition. The protection, he argued, of experiments in living, the capacity of people to live differently, to live according to their own tune, which would mean the diminishment of custom, the diminishment of the role of society in some ways of forming the kind of character that might uh, be seen as an impingement upon individual liberty. And the other great thinker we can think of in the American context, also writing around this time, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Right, writing uh, uh, 1841, a year after uh, Tocqueville's publication of volume two of Democracy in America, his great essay, Self-Reliance, which is a kind of similar articulation that one finds in Mill, that it's the ascendancy of the individual over any group, overcoming a kind of reliance upon uh, uh, the, the views or even um, the sort of material needs of any other person. This is a, uh, picked up by uh, Emerson's uh, uh, near contemporary uh, Henry David Thoreau, of course, in his great book, Walden. It becomes kind of a, a theme in American self-understanding. In other words, what seems to be a characteristic Anglo-American understanding is to divide the world in some ways into 
understanding that there's either the freedom of the individual or one's membership in the collectivity, and that these are the stark choices that are before us. That in the Anglo-American tradition, one can either be in the party of individual liberty or in the party of some form of membership that's defined by relationships with others, in which oneself is bound up with others, a kind of sense of myself being continuous with some form of a group. And this understanding, of course, was deeply and profoundly reified and indeed deepened during the Cold War, in which we saw the world as basically divided between two great political possibilities, Soviet communism, collectivism of the state, and liberal democracy, the primacy of the individual. And yet in reading Tocqueville, one is presented with the possibility that perhaps this view is incorrect. Perhaps this way of understanding the nature of the human phenomenon is insufficient at the very least, and perhaps downright incorrect. What Tocqueville understands, in fact, and indeed articulates in that chapter I was just mentioning, the love of equality over, over liberty, is in fact that in liberal democracy, properly understood, extreme equality and extreme liberty are likely to coincide. They're likely, in fact, to become almost indistinguishable. He begins that chapter with the following lines. He says, one can imagine an extreme point at which freedom and equality touch each other and intermingle. Then with no one differing from those like him, no one will be able to exercise tyrannical power. Men will be perfectly free because they will be entirely equal. And they will all be perfectly equal because they will be entirely free. This is the ideal toward which democratic peoples tend. This is the ideal. This is the telos of democracy in some ways. This is its final destination. A people completely equal because they have been completely liberated from everyone else. And a people completely equal because they no longer are in some ways defined by or in some kind of debt or relationship with others. And it's no coincidence that the chapter that follows this chapter, volume two, part two, chapter two, really easy to remember, two, 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 is his very famous and rightly famous chapter of individualism in democratic ages, in which he describes that in some ways the, the end station, the telos of democracy, is the extreme liberation of individuals from everyone else, described as a kind of delinking, not only of individuals from one another in this time and in this place, but the liberation of individuals generationally, that were freed from any sense of relationship to those that once existed in a time before us and in a time after us. The freedom of self-definition, that freedom that Emerson and Mill praise of the self-creating self. But far from being something praiseworthy in Tocqueville's mind, this is a great threat ultimately to democracy in America. Far from being the kind of ideal to which we ought to seek democracy to become, Tocqueville regards this great threat of individualism as in some ways the deepest form of undermining the possibility of the best and the truest form of democracy. In this sense, Tocqueville seems to me to challenge our Anglo-American view that freedom is best understood as the freedom and the delinking of the individual from the fates of others, both those whom we live with, those who preceded us, and those who will follow us. What Tocqueville instead urges is to understand that true liberty, the liberty that he believes can, be, can flourish in a democratic age, will be the result of a kind of public freedom that will result from ro robust democratic engagement with other people. The capacity of people to be drawn outside of themselves, not to insist on the perfection of their individual selves, but to understand that our selves only in some senses become truly what they are, when they're engaged in a deep and profound and ongoing way in the lives and the fates of others. When Tocqueville describes the activity of people engaged in the democratic give and take in civil society and political society, he speaks of it often as an enlargement of the heart, the enlargement of the self, rather than that withdrawing of the self, what he calls the withdrawal of the individual into the solitude of our own hearts, he argues that democracy rightly understood makes us bigger than when we entered the civil space, the political space. 
Tocqueville then seems to describe two kinds of democracies, two possible futures for democracy. One that's democratic as a kind of verb, as a kind of activity, as a kind of give and take. And one rather that becomes a kind of condition in which the assertion of the self becomes its key feature, but in which the result is a diminution of democratic energies and a shrinking of the self beneath the enlargement of the state and the massive uh, apparatus that was required uh, to, to sense our individual liberty. So we're gathered today to talk about the crisis of liberal democracy. And it seems to me that at the heart of this crisis is that our parties today, whether it's the party of equality or the party of liberty, have, or at least until recent history, had become the parties of the equal liberty of, in, of the individual, of the delinked individual. That you had on the political right, the delinking of the, of the individual, especially in and through the economic realm, through a globalized economy, the liberation of the self from any time and place in this globalized uh, economic sphere. And on the left, the kind of praise of the sort of John Stuart Millian experiments in living, the explosion of individuality, the hostility to custom, to the past, to culture and tradition that this especially has circled and formed itself around a view of defending every aspect of the sexual revolution. But notice that both of these parts of these two parties have essentially coalesced on exactly what Tocqueville said would be the trajectory of liberal democracy, which would be the praise of and embrace of this idea of the delinked self. In its reaction, in the reaction of, uh, it seems to me, of what we call this populism, what, what Paul Carice called angry populism, the source of it in many ways is a kind of blowback, a blowback against this vision of the liberated, delinked self, and the effort in some way, however inarticulate and inchoate, to begin to try to form some form of human community in which our fates might be shared, in which we might see the possibility of a democracy not simply as the liberation of the individual from all others, but rather in and through the possibility of human communities. I think that this uh, reaction is inchoate and inarticulate and is likely to go bad, but I think we need to respect its sources because its sources, it seems to me, lie in what Tocqueville recognized would be the inherent danger of democracy, not only in America, but in the world. And unless we give thought to it seems to me the false form of liberty that he describes will be the likely form of liberty that we'll be attracted to. We're likely all to end up not only with very little liberty, but extremely little equality as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kreese, for, for inviting us. Patrick and I uh, were colleagues at Georgetown and I promise you I didn't see his paper before, uh, before, we before he talked. Um, but I want to take, uh, take umbrage with the term populism. <clears throat> and so uh, the title of my remarks might be understood in the following way. Populism is not our problem, existential homelessness in the West. During the run-up to the 2016 election in the United States, leaders of both the Democratic and the Republican parties, who had agreed on nothing for more than a generation, suddenly and without sustained conversation concluded that populism was the emergent threat. Partisans have sharp vision, vision, but they seldom have clear vision. To understand our troubled world, I think we have to do better. We have to reopen the seemingly settled question and ask, what really do we see? In the concluding paragraph of the author's introduction to democracy in America, written in 1835, Tocqueville wrote, I have tried to see not differently but further than any party, that while they are busy with tomorrow, I wish to consider the whole of the future. Let's follow his lead in the hope of seeing further than the parties. Democracy in America, written shortly after Tocqueville's visit to Jacksonian America, that brief historical period, which, is, which the supposed populism of today is an echo, makes no mention whatsoever of populism. Wishing to see further, what did Tocqueville see? During the 1950s, scholars thought he saw American exceptionalism and invoked his insights to argue that Marx's ideas could never make sense in America. During the 1990s, scholars thought that Tocqueville saw the need for civic associations and relied on his insights to argue that formerly communist countries required associations if the spirit of liberty were to take hold. In 
Both of these are true but partial insights into the larger meaning of Tocqueville's great work. In a haunting letter written in 1856, just a few years before he died, Tocqueville lamented, this profound saying could be applied to me especially only, it is not good for man to be alone. This observation brings us closer to the whole of the truth. Tocqueville's visit to Jacksonian America did not lead him to write a book about populism. Instead, his great work is informed by the central and growing problem Tocqueville saw everywhere he looked, existential homelessness. Democracy in America is an extended rumination on the homeless man of the democratic age. Today, the problem of existential homelessness has become acute. Growing rates of anxiety, loneliness, and suicide are its statistical confirmations. Facebook and Amazon are among the largest and most powerful corporations on the planet. Yet the realization is dawning everywhere that social media friends, I put that in quote, are poor substitutes for the real thing, that man cannot live by online shopping alone. Thanks to the orchestrated informational feeds that come our way, the mobile phone we clutch in our hands connects us to the whole world while it imprisons us inside of ourselves. Human life must be lived on a human scale in the face-to-face -face relations of everyday life and in real time. Those face-to-face -face relations extend from our local neighborhoods to the nation, the largest and most durable community known to man. Since 1989, in the end of the Cold War, we have tried to build a world without them. As I will indicate below, we have built a world around the conf configuration of what I call management society and selfie man. Against the backdrop of this unsustainable and lifeless configuration, is it any wonder really that the idea of the nation, however currently incoherently formulated, should appear in the imagination of homeless man as a solve for the wound that shows no sign of otherwise healing? Instead of homelessness, our parties inform us that the crisis we face is populism. If only that were so, Populism is a policy problem. It, it's something we can fix, say, by cutting a better deal domestically with the struggling middle class or by adjusting trade policy. Homelessness of the existential sort Tocqueville had in mind has no easy fix, though certain policies can certainly help it get back on track. Homelessness is a deeper problem than the political policies that political policies alone cannot address. address. Tocqueville marveled that American federalism helped address this problem of homelessness by giving people, quote, a share in their government. Yet how can federalism today work if we're so frightened by real-time, everyday life dealings with our fellow citizens that we text message one another to see if we can stop by and, or talk over the phone or stop by at all? Policy changes can touch the fringe of the problem but cannot penetrate to its center. That is why a fix is so difficult. Our parties would rather have us believe our crisis can be solved by policies that falls to them alone to invent and implement. Not the case. There is another reason why it would be much less difficult to address the problem if our crisis were populism rather than existential homelessness. Using the term populism affords us the opportunity to think in oppositional terms, which is always easier and morally cleaner than wrestling with matters in more thought-provoking and adequate ways. The alternative before us, if we think this way is, uh, is, uh, in terms of oppositions, is simple and stark. Either we defend the globalist project of complete economic, political, and cultural integration and thereby create a universal human society, or we fall back into the parochial inherited nations and lesser communities from which we have come and to which we are, in some measure, still bound. The either or of globalism and populism promises easy moral satisfaction. For the globalists, the moral enemy is the unenlightened masses. For the populists, the moral enemy is the putatively enlightened elites. Set up in this way, the conflict between the two self-assured parties only grows and the unaddressed crisis quickens. With each passing day, we see this happening. The, the opposing parties are feeding off of one another. As they do, we silently listen to the whispering voice that wonders if these conflicting views must end in war. Here I propose that Tocqueville's democracy in America can be a gentle guide that reveals what happens inside the soul in the democratic age. With its guidance, we can see that homelessness, not populism, is the crisis that we face. Since 1989, globalism has been our watchword. Although we think globalism is a new thing, Tocqueville saw the impulse that gave rise to it already back in 1835. Our understanding of it today, of course, is largely economic and cultural. We speak of global markets and of the overwhelming power of Western culture, which corrodes and dissolves local, regional, and national cultures everywhere. We take economic and cultural globalization, in fact, to be proof of an irreversible process, opposition to which is futile and parochial. In democracy in America, Tocqueville had already foreseen the coming homogenization of life. He writes, variety is disappearing from the human race. 
The same ways of behaving, thinking, and feeling are found in every corner of the world. Tocqueville, the ever subtle sociologist and psychologist, thought that the deeper underlying cause of we, what we call globalization was the gradual and inevitable breaking of links that occurred as we moved from the aristocratic age to the democratic age. He worried, moreover, about the thoughts that would come, quote, naturally into the imagination once these links were fully broken. In his words, aristocracy links everyone from peasant to king in one long chain. Democracy breaks the chain and frees each link. Thus, not only does democracy make men forget their ancestors, but also clouds their view of their descendants and isolates them from their contemporaries. Each man is forever thrown back on himself, and there is a danger that he may be shut up in the solitude of his own heart. As this happened, Tocqueville thought the mind would imagine a fugitive perfection that because of the inheritance of history was still binding, was impossible to conceive of in the democratic age. From the self-evident philosophical point of departure in the democratic age would, have, would arise the view that all things can be changed, improved, rationalized, and made to conform to a comprehensive system. What a contrast this is from the aristocratic age in which the impossibility of turning the world into the system meant that life's burdens could be ameliorated at best, but never changed. A single coordinated world was conceivable in the aristocratic age only if God himself brought it about, since by mortal efforts it would have been thought impossible. The democratic man, on the other hand, dares to think that such a project of unification is within his grasp, that he, not God, can save the planet, as environmentalists have declared, or that through man's effort a globally coordinated world can be managed. In the democratic age, Tocqueville said, unity will become an obsession. Rather than see around us a plurality of unique unfoldings that constitute emergent wagers about possible alternative futures, in principle unknowable in advance, democratic man will need his world to be a system that he can manage and unify. In short, a plural emergent and future world that he cannot control will terrify us. Liberal pluralism, evolutionary biology, and market commerce all presume an unfolding emergent world. Tocqueville saw already in 1835 that such a presupposition would frighten Demo democratic man and that he would become fixated instead on unity as a way to insulate himself from the terror. Real differences, differences between men and women, between peoples and between states would become psychologically unbearable. Hence, in the post-1989 world, the need for men and women to be seen as interchangeable, the need to believe that cultural and natural inheritance that distinguishes English us everywhere around the globe need to be jettisoned rather than honored, the need to institute democracy everywhere. Where is the citizen, Tocqueville wondered already in 1835, who is prepared to live, on the contrary, in a non-parsimonious world, a world that does not cohere as a system to be managed, a world so wondrous and unknowable that we would be able to cherish and protect the liberty through which we participate fully in its mysterious developments at all levels, from the local to the national. While Tocqueville wrote reverentially of the, preferential, of the precious gifts of liberty in the democratic age, he clearly understood that democratic man would find the plural world of parochial and local national attachments to which this liberty had to be embedded too much of an encumbrance for him to endure. He would wish to take flight. Having already broken free of some of the linkages that bound him to the past, to others, to nature, democratic man would wish to break free from all of them. That is why today so many of us are spiritual rather than religious co-parents rather than fathers and mothers, global citizens rather than citizens of this or that country, anywheres rather than somewheres. Always cognizant of our finitude, we long for the universals through which we imagine we will find release. It's worth noting that Tocqueville had judged that this democratic impulse went too far. Human beings are finally creatures that must have a home, a family, a locale, a nation, a religion. The psychological dilemma of the democratic age is that democratic man can see beyond the immediacy of his parochial horizons by virtue of the delinkage that Tocqueville thought defined that democratic age. Democratic man therefore sees the cosmopolitan promise, but because he is an embodied creature, the promise can never be fully realized. Hence the agony of all of us romantic souls who see in every choice a limit to, an un to the unbounded freedom we intimate is truly our own. So far, I've indicated that Tocqueville anticipated the globalist disposition. We might say, furthermore, that Tocqueville thought that there was a need to temper it. Yet if we were to stop here, the picture is both, both of our crisis of our times 
and of Tocqueville's anticipation of it would be incomplete. The globalist disposition has not emerged as a singularity. At the same time that everything local and national is being repudiated in the name of global universalism, something else has emerged, which we seldom connect with globalist disposition, but which is connected, namely the phenomena of identity politics, which has insulated st uh, citizens one from another, while at the same time giving them the opportunity for heretofore undreamed of self-elevation. Why is it, we must wonder, that precisely at the moment when we deny families, neighbors, towns, regions, and states can constructively address the difficulties we faced, hundreds of millions of us, perhaps even billions, are forever taking selfies of ourselves. At the very moment when you and I seem powerless in a globalized world, we take pictures of ourselves everywhere, as if the world around us becomes important only by virtue of the record of our presence in it. Globalism and identity politics is the configuration at which we are at once powerless to act with our neighbors to solve our problems and empowered beyond our wildest imaginations so that we don't need our neighbors at all. I don't profess to give a comprehensive account of this right now. Here I want to consider the curious relationship in light of Tocqueville's very luminous remark at the end of democracy in America. In the future, he warned, democratic citizens would feel themselves to be either greater than kings or less than men. Does this not sum, sum up the current psychic condition in much of the West? Tocqueville predicted it long ago. In our selfie lives, protected by our impervious identities, we are greater than kings. For we remove from our kingdoms without recourse all who do not accede to our self-presentation on our Facebook pages. On the other hand, with respect to the communal actions necessary to build the world together, we are less than men and happily hand over the keys to the global managers. Democratic politics, Tocqueville knew it was not possible if we are at once greater than king and less than men. Insofar as selfie man is political at all, it is through episodic activism, not through the labor of engaged citizens. For selfie man, politics is no longer the hard work of face-to-face, local-to-national democratic deliberation ordered and upheld by the Constitution. Rather, politics is activism, the goal for which is for the government to bestow rights on different identity groups with the expectation that such groups will owe allegiance to the, and vote for the party whose administration grants it. I've offered this passage in which Tocqueville anticipates the emergence of democratic man, it, it, the emergence of selfie man in, in the democratic age. Uh, much of, our effort, of the effort in democracy in America is directed toward pulling selfie man out of himself so that we may build a home with others. Building home with others is not possible, however, without the give and take of everyday life in real time. To declare, those enthralled by, as, to declare as those enthralled by identity politics do that I have this identity and you must respect it is to cut short the long labor of working together with our neighbors through which we come to discover who we are. We are unknown to ourselves and only gain a foothold on self-knowledge through our dealings with others. Tocqueville understood this and worried that as the democratic man closed in upon himself, his life would become both small and inappropriately self-assured. That is why he wrote extensively about self-interest rightly understood, by which he meant that form of self-interest formed in and through relations with others. Without it, we will end up with selfie man, and that is where we are today. What is to be done? We should start by noting that the crisis that has occurred because has occurred because we have dreamed that the limits of ordinary life can be circumvented without cost. In a letter of 1836, Tocqueville called himself a liberal of a new kind. There is no simple formula that comprehends what the full meaning of this phrase is. First, there is much talk today that the liberal world order is being dismantled by those who envision alternatives to it. Tocqueville would have said that a homogeneous world order is not a liberal world order at all. A liberal world order is a plural world order with multiple nations making multiple wagers about possible alternative futures. A liberal world order, in short, is an emergent world order which cannot be organized and ordered from above, as so-called liberals have been trying to do at least since 1989. Second, by liberal, Tocqueville thought, Tocqueville meant that the labors of building a world together begin in our immediate society, in our family, civic life, and religious associations. Those can be supplemented by the work of the state, but they cannot be substituted. So with the work of the state, so, so too with the work of the state. The state can be, a sup, can be supplemented by global efforts, as in the EU, et cetera, but those global efforts cannot be turned into a substitute for our embodied communities. Thinking about the problem of this liberal emergent bottom 
thinking about the problem in this liberal emergent bottom-up way allows us to avoid talking in ideological ways about being for or against globalism. In one of the most important passages in democracy in America, Tocqueville wrote that feelings and ideas are, are uh, excuse me, renewed, the heart enlarged, and the mind expanded only by the reciprocal actions of men one upon another. It's in the face-to-face -face relations we begin to build the world. Higher levels of organization supplement those face-to-face -face relations, but they cannot substitute for them without cost. Today, we are paying the cost. We've cre created the benumbed configuration of management, society, and selfie man, a world in which we are greater than kings and less than men. We're promised release and liberation from our parochial bonds through globalism and the management society that will make it possible. We are promised safe space security from identity politics and the social media platforms that make selfie life possible. This configuration, fit only for homeless souls, is on the verge of collapsing. We should be both hopeful and worried about what we will build with the debris left over from the inevitable collapse. Thank you. For more than a century now, the Friends of Liberty, local autonomy, and civic agency have been in retreat, and the administrative state has grown by leaps and bounds. The ideological foundation for this development was laid during the presidential campaigns of 1912, when both Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt attacked the Constitution, and William Howard Taft, its only defender, came in a dismal third. The institutional foundation was put in place one year later with the ratification of the 16th and 17th Amendments to the Constitution, which legalized the federal income tax and provided for the direct election of United States senators, putting the federal government in a position to secure for itself unlimited funding and denying to the state legislatures, which had once chosen the senators, the capacity to defend state and local governments against federal encroachment. Since that time, almost without a respite, local autonomy has been giving ground, and the advocates of centralized administration have gradually extended their tentacles into nearly every corner of public and private life. To be more precise, since 1928, the only real difference between Republicans and Democrats has been the pace, not the direction. Herbert Hoover, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, George Herbert Walker Bush, and George W. Bush may not have been as enthusiastic about extending federal power as Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and Barack Obama, but they were nonetheless assiduous. Even under Ronald Reagan, the only recent president who made a concerted attempt to limit its growth, the federal government of the United States extended its reach. Of course, the localities and the states still exist. Elections take place. There are school boards, town, city, county, and state governments, and they still matter even if on a great and growing variety of subjects, they take their orders from a national government that offers them vast sums in funding in return for strict compliance with its every whim. Our polity is a hodgepodge, but with every passing year, the burden of federal regulation becomes more intolerable, and the number of mandates with increasing rapidity grows. Moreover, nearly all of the regulations imposed are devised by unelected civil servants and political appointees to whom Congress, undeniably in breach of the Constitution's separation of powers, has delegated legislative, executive, and judicial responsibilities. And next to nothing with regard to these is examined and voted on by elected officials who can be held responsible by the voting public for the consequences of what has been done. Moreover, what remains undecided within the administrative agencies is generally dealt with in courts unresponsive to the electorate. We may still take pride in being a self-governing people but to an ever-increasing degree, that pretense is unsustainable. To an ever-increasing degree, we are well-policed in the worst sense of that phrase. If we're ever to put a stop to the advance of the administrative state and roll it back, if we are to recover the liberty that was once ours and reassert our dignity as individuals 
responsible for governing ourselves, and as citizens, we must first come to understand what it is that occasioned centralized administration's inexorable march. Here I would submit Alexis de Tocqueville, who died 159 years ago, on the 16th of April, 1859, is our best guide. For what he feared with regard to his native France is increasingly true for the United States, to be precise. To an ever increasing degree, our compatriots are subject to what he described as an immense tutelary power which takes sole charge of assuring their enjoyment and watching over their fate. As he predicted, this power is absolute, attentive to detail, regular, provident, and gentle. And it works willingly for their happiness, but it wishes to be the only agent and the sole arbiter of that happiness. It provides for their security, foresees and supplies their needs, guides them in their principal affairs, directs their industry, regulates their testaments, divides their inheritance. It is entirely proper to ask whether it can relieve them entirely of the trouble of thinking and of the effort associated with living. For such evidently is its aim. Moreover, he says, after taking each individual in this fashion by turns into its powerful hands, and after having needed him in accord with its desires, the sovereign extends its arms about the society as a whole. It covers its surface with a network of petty regulations, complicated, minute, and uniform, through which even the most original minds and the most vigorous souls know not how to make their way past the crowd and to emerge into the light of day. It does not break wills. It softens them, bends, and directs them. Rarely does it force one to act, but it constantly opposes itself to one's acting on one's own. It does not destroy. It prevents things from being born. It does not tyrannize. It gets in the way. It curtails. It innervates. It extinguishes. It stupefies. And finally, it reduces each nation to nothing more than a herd of timid and industrious animals, of which the government is the shepherd. As I said, when Tocqueville wrote these words, he did not have our country in mind. He was worried, and rightly so, about his native France. And indeed, he wrote every word in democracy in America with an eye to his native France. His subject was democracy. America was simply an example. And in his book, he emphasized those aspects of American life that might be instructive for the French to understand. Uh, there were other luminaries, such as Tocqueville's teacher, Francois Guizot, who looked forward with bated breath to the rule of a technocratic elite armed with authority confirmed by a liberal quasi-democratic regime. Tocqueville in that anticipated something much more ominous. The establishment of a social body that would be intent on exercising foresight with regard to everything that would act as a second providence, nourishing men from birth and protecting them from perils, and that would function as a tutelary power capable of rendering men gentle and sociable in such a manner that while crimes would become rare, so would virtues as well. Under the rule of this tutelary power, he foresaw that the human soul would enter into a long repose. In the process, individual energy would be almost extinguished, and when action was required, men would rely on others. In effect, a peculiar brand of egoism, of what he called egoism, would reign, for everyone would withdraw into himself. If fanaticism disappeared, as he suspected it would, so would convictions and beliefs and human agency itself. The new and unprecedented species of servitude that Tocqueville had in mind was, as he later observed, regulated, gentle or soft, and favorable to peace. And he suggested that it could be combined more easily than men were inclined to imagine with some of the external forms of liberty. He even suggests that it would be possible for it to be established in the very so shadow of the sovereignty of the people. In this fashion, with the institution of a unitary, tutelary, all-powerful government, elected by the citizens at regular intervals, 
one might actually satisfy two contradictory impulses found among his contemporaries, uh, the felt need for guidance and the longing to remain free. What this would involve, Tocqueville explained, is a species of compromise between administrative despotism and the sovereignty of the people, a corrupt bargain between the ghost of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and that of his erstwhile admirer, Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, in which the political doctrine of Rousseau is deployed rhetorically for the purpose of legitimizing a law-abiding, steady, reliable despotism on the model of pre-modern China, of the very sort that was espoused in full knowledge of what they were embracing by Turgot's mentors among the physiocrats. Under such an arrangement, Tocqueville remarked, pointedly paraphrasing what Rousseau had once said of the English, the citizens emerge for a moment from dependence for the purpose of indicating their masters, and then re-enter without further ado their former estate of dependence. They console themselves for being in tutelage with the thought that they have chosen the tutors themselves. And they think that they have sufficiently guaranteed the liberties of the individual when they have delivered it to the national power. This was the fear that Tocqueville brought with him to North America, that the great democratic revolution sweeping the globe in the wake of the American and French revolutions would eventuate not in liberty, but in a soft, gentle despotism welcomed by those subject to it. He came to these shores hoping against hope that he would discover in our country an antidote for the process that had in France produced a Napoleon that seemed likely to eventuate as it did in something far less impressive than the first Bonaparte I have in mind, the second Bonaparte. What lay behind Tocqueville's fears? Two things, I think. First and most obviously, his experience and that of his family during the French Revolution under Napoleon and after. And second, the interpretive framework that guided his thinking. When he published Democracy in America, he was hailed in France as the new Montesquieu. And that was appropriate because Montesquieu's spirit of the laws was his model. This is vitally important. For that book by Montesquieu, published in 1748, was the chief source of political wisdom for the American founding fathers. In the period from 1762 to 1800, throughout the American Revolution, the critical period, and the epoch when the Constitution was framed, and the Second American Republic was set in motion by George Washington and his colleagues, no book, not even John Locke's two treatises of government, was more often consulted and cited. It was consulted and cited, moreover, by anti-federalists and federalists alike, and during the 1780s and the 1790s, it was consulted and cited for one reason. Montesquieu, who bestrode the age intellectually like a colossus, had argued emphatically that forms of government have to be tailored to the extent of territory to be governed, that republics are suited to small territories, monarchies to territories of intermediate extent, and despotism to territories of very great extent, such as the fledgling United States. How, the Americans asked, could one establish a viable republic on a territory as vast as that occupied by the United States and as vast as that likely to be occupied by the United States in the future as it spread across the continent? Indeed, how could a viable republic be established on a territory as vast as that of Virginia, Pennsylvania, or New York? Having posed this challenge, Montesquieu suggested a way that this could be done. One could combine the military advantages of a monarchy with the political advantages of a republic by means of federalism, as the Dutch had done. He also intimated that there was another way to achieve this. The English form of government, which he called a republic hidden under the form of a monarchy, was situated on a large territory. And Montesquieu nowhere suggests that this form of government is restricted with regard to the extent of territory that it can effectively govern. It overcomes the ordinary territorial limits prescribed for republics by the expedient of the separation of powers. That is, by dividing power, by establishing balances and checks, and by distinguishing functionally between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, one can overcome the monarchical and even despotic propensities possessed by republics situated on extended territories. The framers of the American Constitution took up both of Montesquieu's suggestions, and the polity that they established in North America gave every appearance of having combined political liberty and territorial magnitude. It was the American example that gave Tocqueville hope 
because Tocqueville operated in the same terms as Montesquieu and as the framers of the American Constitution. Democracy in America is, in a sense, an extended commentary on the Federalist. Moreover, it was here on these shores that Tocqueville discovered what he was looking for in decentralized administration, in local self-government, in civic associations, in an unfettered press, in biblical religion, and in the marital solidarity characteristic of Jacksonian America, he found what he took to be an antidote for, antidote for the soft despotism that he rightly saw as democracy's drift. Above all, he was persuaded that where there is centralized administration and individual citizens find themselves alone facing the state, they will succumb to the disposition of uneasiness and anxiety that Blaise Pascal, the Baron de Montesquieu, and Rousseau had called anquietude, a kind of restlessness, a kind of anxiety, a kind of fear. And in search of a sense of security, they would gradually become passive subjects who look to an all-powerful providential state for their welfare. But he also saw where there is considerable local autonomy, as there was in the United States, and the citizens experience civic agency by joining together to get things done, and learn the art of association by participating in self-government in the localities, where there is a genuine and spirited public debate, where the citizens find in biblical religion a moral anchor and the foundation for a conviction of their own dignity, and where they are sustained by domestic tranquility within their homes. The sense of anquietude typical of liberal democratic men will give way to a trust in their own capacities and they will be likely to, to be anything but passive and to have the confidence to join together and face down officials intent on lording it over them. One cannot read Tocqueville's description of doc democracy in America with equanimity today. For as I've already intimated to a considerable extent, the world that he described is lost. The states and localities are enthralled to the federal government. Civic associations survive almost solely as lobbying operations in Washington. Newspapers are disappearing hither and yon. Christianity and Judaism have lost their hold on much of our population. The divorce rate is shockingly high. And last year, 40% of all children born in this country were born out of wedlock. In fact, uh, the 54% of all children born to women aged 18 to 34 were born out of wedlock. We cannot continue on this path, on the path we now tread, and sustain a genuine democracy. So what I want to suggest to you is that one needs to go back and think about the things that Tocqueville thought about. Local self-government, civic associations, an unfettered press, biblical religion, and marital solidarity. That will produce citizens capable of resisting administrative tyranny. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I also want to thank um, Paul Carice very much for the invitation. Um, and I thought of starting this uh, talk by saying, and now for something completely different. Um, because I'm going to talk about Tocqueville the political man, Tocqueville in politics. Um, in fact, we should remember that he wrote Democracy in America uh, partly to make a name for himself. He hoped that it would help him to launch a political career that would allow him to participate in the great challenge of his time to consolidate a stable liberal democratic regime in France. So the strategy partly worked. Uh, his fame as an author, um, as um, uh, we've been reminded, uh, helped to get him elected uh, to the Chamber of Deputies in the July monarchy. He remained in national politics until the coup of Louis Napoleon drove him out in 1851. But he and his fellow politicians, in fact, failed to create a lasting representative regime. So what I want to talk about a bit today um, is his diagnosis of what went wrong. Because I think uh, that 19th century France um, uh, is in some ways a better analog to our current situation than Jacksonian America um, for slightly different reasons um, than Paul has just mentioned. In the United States, 
Tocqueville tells us in Democracy in America, the biggest problem in institutional design was how to bridle state legislatures and the National Congress to prevent tyranny of the majority. He was relatively unconcerned about the power of the executive because in egalitarian societies with fully democratic political institutions, legislative overreach was likely to be the more immediate threat to freedom. The lack of a widespread administrative apparatus at the disposal of the president in the United States and the weakness and isolation of America on the world stage would limit the damage, uh, in any case, that the executive could do. In 19th century France, and here in the US, uh, in our own day, I would submit, the problem was and is the opposite. Executive overreach and legislative weakness in a situation in which the executive and the national administration are inevitably centralized to a much greater degree than was true in the early American Republic. Like the 19th century French, we live in a political system in which a powerful executive is the focus of the popular imagination, in which the prestige of the national legislature is very low ebb, 15% approval in the last uh, survey, I think, in which the public exhibits very little trust in elites, in which the national legislature is deeply divided by partisan enmity, um, mirroring deep social divisions in the country. In particular, I want to focus on Tocqueville's analysis of the failures of his own generation of legislators to reclaim the moral high ground and develop what he thought to be their proper role as the moral center of French politics. Now, before proceeding, I want to pause a, a moment and defend a statement that um, many of you may already have found uh, surprising or a little questionable, namely that Tocqueville <laughs> who is um, typically, um, and we've just heard a, a, a very eloquent uh, discussion of this, tagged as hostile to centralization. Um, I think that, in fact, he foresaw a rather large role for centralization in the democratic uh, future, the one that he hoped for as well as the one that he feared. So I'm going to begin with a quotation found in the manuscript of part four of the 1840 democracy, in which Tocqueville reminded himself Contained within certain limits, centralization is a necessary fact, and I add that it is a fact about which we must be glad. A strong and intelligent central power is one of the first political necessities in centuries of equality. Acknowledge it boldly. So centralization of purpose and power, not only governmental but also administrative, was necessary in both foreign and domestic affairs to maintain one's prestige as a great power, to carry out great national projects, building canals, roads, railroads, creating a sound banking system, encouraging the growth of pure science, coordinating what we would call welfare policies. For all of these projects, Tocqueville thought a strong state was needed, or in his words, only the legislator can do it. But what constituted intelligent centralization? What were the limits? The goal was to create the right balance between central control and private initiative. Tocqueville was completely disgusted, for example, by the meddling policies of the French administrative state in France's colonies. Um, but mostly because they were not because they were doing too much, but because they were doing it badly and backwards and creating chaos and uncertainty. The problem was a combination of ignorant and arrogant governmental mismanagement by central administrators, a pattern that Tocqueville eventually traced to the old regime. Indeed, in his notes for the old regime, in chronicling the brutal policies of extorted labor, he says, you'd think you were in Algeria. It's often been eloquently pointed out that the old regime is a devastating critique of the centralized monarchy and its legacy for French politics. Yet what strikes me in rereading it in light of Tocqueville's previous uh, calls for intelligent centralization is that he could be a fan of, as he says, moderate and prudent um, and effective government if governing was done right. It's not that the government shouldn't coordinate things. In an advanced democratic society, there's no one else to do it. It's just that it shouldn't be using the tools of the old regime to do it. We might go so far as to say that the worst crime of the old regime monarchy was not extending its power, but extending its power in a corrupt way, using taxation to exacerbate inequalities, renting out or even selling core functions of the state to ambitious place seekers, brutally exploiting the weakest members of society. This use of power to make citizens incapable of cooperation and public-minded activity 
was the most difficult legacy that the old regime bequeathed to Tocqueville and his generation. This obsession with corruption brings me to the real point of my remarks. Tocqueville's analysis of what was wrong with the national legislature uh, in which he served in France and how his contemporaries should think about reforming it. To speak and act because you hope to gain favor from those who hold power rather than to deliberate freely and independently about public matters is largely what Tocqueville meant by political corruption. The coming of democracy with its erosion of aristocratic norms, focus on economic progress, privileging of material self-interest, and greater number of individuals involved in governing would inevitably increase the potential for corruption. In this regard, he thought, the situation of France revealed the problem in a stark way. The French, according to Tocqueville, were the first to try to combine three things that had never yet been united in the same time and place, but would need to be in the future united. An egalitarian society, centralization, and a serious representative system. Unfortunately, a perfect storm of circumstances in post-revolutionary France had encouraged a dysfunctional way of combining these three things. So what were these circumstances and, and how could the pathology be overcome? So a little, a little um, uh, history lesson here. Um, so France had a very highly restricted electorate whose instincts, Tocqueville thought, were now shaped by egalitarian materialistic passions unleashed by the coming of democracy. It also had a large centralized administration in which paid positions controlled by the government were lucrative ways to get ahead in society. These offices could be bartered for electoral support or votes in parliament. Indeed, to overcome a fractured and divided parliament and get something done, the government of his old teacher, Francois Guizot, was deliberately attempting to cement support through interest and patronage. So the government, in Tocqueville's view, bribed deputies to support its policies, and then the deputies, in turn, bribed voters in order to get elected. The bureaucracy was so big and the electorate was so small that the entire political system had become a, become a kind of self-serving game of exploiting public goods for private ends. But what I think is very interesting is what outraged Tocqueville most about this insider political trading in offices and places was the insidious effect of this corrupt activity on the public. Democratic instincts, the individualism and the selfie culture that we have heard about today among the population, um, as well as centralization, certainly helped to cause the legislature to go awry. It caused legislative dysfunction. But the sorry spectacle of a corrupt governing system in which deputies modeled bad citizenship, insulted each other, and exaggerated their differences in a kind of partisan charade in turn worsened and deepened the very materialism and individualism that made it possible. Meanwhile, the national government had abandoned the needs of the poorest citizens, who then caused political unrest by falling under the sway of dangerous fantasies of political salvation through a leader or through revolutionary um, movements. So what was to be done? Tocqueville um, was a practical man, and he was never one to succumb to fatalism or determinism. If political elites were part of the problem, they also had the power to find a solution by altering the structural situation and also working to change elite practices and norms. I think it's fascinating to consider the strategies that Tocqueville entertained to fight French political corruption because they're not exactly what a reader of democracy in America might expect. Rather than decentralization, he recommended intelligent centralization. He hoped to reduce the opportunity to use offices as a bartering medium by changing the laws that allowed the revolving door between the bureaucracy and the parliament and that governed the electoral system. That is, he wanted to use national law to regulate. Second, he hoped, as in the case of mismanagement in the French colonies, um, to professionalize the bureaucracy through competitive examinations, somewhat on the model of Prussia. He was under no illusion that imposing what he called limits and rules would completely solve the problems of the democratic social state. But he thought such intervention was necessary to halt the disastrous deterioration of legislative norms. It was still possible to recognize in his, in his view, and this is from a famous speech he gave to his um, fellow deputies, it's still possible to recognize violations and excesses practices and rhetoric 
that were beyond the pale in a legislature. But soon, the lack of any standard of honorable political behavior would become the new normal, and any chance to revive civic life would be extinguished. Finally, Tocqueville hoped to counter the undesirable effects on the public that flowed from a political elite that modeled bad citizenship uh, by reconstructing a great opposition party in the country, beginning with a parliamentary coalition of public-spirited sp legislators. Throughout his time in Parliament, Tocqueville proposed several versions of this new patriotic alignment. Perhaps the most well-known was his effort to create what he called a new left in the late 1840s. His proposed strategy was to support a modest increase in the electorate and to create enthusiasm among old voters and new voters for a more principled opposition by promoting more just social policies. For example, tax reforms that would, quote, rework the entire system in such a way as to reduce the burden on the poor and increase it a bit on the rich. He counted on the popular appeal of a new coalition of the willing and hoped that the electorate would then increase the representation of this coalition in Parliament. Now, it has to be said, Tocqueville's efforts to create such a broader movement were continually frustrated and came to nothing. Matters weren't helped by the fact um, that he did not have the skills to play the political game very well. Um, he was nearsighted, so sometimes he insulted his colleagues by failing even to recognize them, never mind rec remember their names. Um, and he couldn't think on his feet or speak very well spontaneously. But I don't think um, that we should focus on his personal political failings um, in thinking about his failure to forge an acceptable way forward um, in post-revolutionary France. I think that his situation reminds us of the vicious circle that can emerge in a dysfunctional democracy. On the one hand, to get anything accomplished, there must be the kind of reciprocity and trust that Tocqueville noticed in the United States. In a famous description from Do Democracy in America, he notes, the American does not expect to bend by force wills that are opposed to his. And he knows that to gain the support of his fellows, it is above all necessary to win their favor. So he is patient, thoughtful, tolerant, slow to act, and per persevering in his designs. Common action requires a certain party loyalty and a willingness to accommodate others. On the other hand, the freedom to break ranks to change course and to speak the truth is crucial in a situation in which others are untrustworthy um, and therefore potentially dangerous as allies. Tocqueville's predicament illustrates the acute tension between compromise and conscience that must be continually negotiated in a dysfunctional legislature. For the most part, the whole time he was in Parliament, he refused to cooperate um, with Guizot's government because its corrupt use of patronage, he thought, appeal to the worst uh, in human nature. But he also distrusts political friendship with others in the opposition, who, he thought, may seem to favor reasonable policies, but are too self-centered or ambitious or volatile uh, to sustain a real sense of common action. Looking back on his career in politics, on his own attempts to maintain this delicate balance between compromise and conscience, I think we can certainly question whether his judgments were always correct, whether opportunities were missed, whether he always succeeded, as he put it in Democracy in America, in seeing not differently but farther than the parties. But the general fa failure of the French political elite to rise to the challenge of combining an egalitarian society, intelligent centralization, and a free political life is quite clear, and Tocqueville puts much, much of the blame squarely on his colleagues and on himself. So in conclusion, I want to I um, give you a quick quotation from Michael Sandel. In a, in a recent article um, on the rise of um, resentment and populism in the United States, he argues um, that this um, resentment taps into, that this populist rising taps into a wellspring of anxieties frustrations and legitimate grievances to which the mainstream parties have no compelling answer. Tocqueville's point to his contemporaries was that the first order of business in curing what ailed liberal democracy was for the political elite, both the leadership and the opposition, to cease considering political privilege as an entitlement and to find a compelling answer to these anxieties and discontents. 
A failure to do so, a continuation of dysfunctional national democracy, would intensify a festering discontent and alienation um, that would inevitably burst out um, in uh, populist resentment. He, of course, experienced the results of his generation's failure. His reflections in the recollections about the 1848 revolution and the country's subsequent slide into dictatorship should be, I think, a cautionary tale. In the recollections, Tocqueville gives us a frightening picture of what it feels like to be estranged from one's fellow citizens to such a degree that they literally become strangers who completely lack mutual tolerance and speak past each other. I think he gives us a stark picture of what we now have termed tribalism in politics. Factions, he says, feel one another out. They come to grips, but neither sees the other. More important, the political class had lost whatever ability it had to read the electorate. Consider his description of the shock among the politicians who had made the 1848 revolution when their candidates lost in the elections to the new assembly. When its candidates were rejected, it fell into depression and rage. It complained, at times mildly, at other times rudely, that the nation was ignorant, ungrateful, mad, and hostile to its own good. Retired from public life, Tocqueville illustrates the effect of scorched earth political tactics on those that it touches. He says, I am barely able to observe political life as a spectator, because a spectator at least pays attention, whereas I do not even take the trouble to watch. This is mainly because of the deepening shadows in which the always obscure future is increasingly shrouded. Or, as he confessed to his brother, I feel like a stranger in my own land, surrounded by people who do not share the ideas that, to my mind, are bound up with every semblance of human dignity. So, in one sense, I think, Tocqueville's reflections on his life in politics give us a window onto a lost political world. But in another sense, he reveals what's wrong with our own. Thank you. Tocqueville was very concerned with norms, being a student of Montesquieu in part. And uh, while there's some concern about decline of norms in America, I must say the four panelists kept extraordinarily well to the uh, time limits that we had all discussed in advance. There's no, no need for an umpire or referee. So we have uh, some time for a few questions. I want to generate discussion on the panel, and then we have time for audience questions. Two of the presentations seem to be focused on the, the psychology and deeper philosophy of liberty in the modern era and its challenges. In contrast to the other two presentations, which focus more on institutions, constitutions, reforms that might be needed to, to structures of, of governing or politics. So uh, which two of you were right and which two of you were wrong? Uh, what, what, would you talk about this? Uh, Tocqueville obviously is not a, 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 um, uh, he's not a, a, a single-minded philosopher. He, he, he is interested in binaries, but, but he often is a both-and kind of thinker, to, to, that multiple principles have to be kept in mind, multiple dimensions of a complicated reality. So I'm sending you something artificial uh, as a question, but, but you know, two of you did think that we first need to discuss deeper philosophical, psychological traumas of the modern era and democratic liberty. Two of you thought we, we need to focus on what has gone wrong with institutions either in Tocqueville's time or, or in America since 1912. So would you, would all, all of you, discuss that? I don't think there's a, I don't really think there's a contradiction. Um, I, I do think that Tocqueville um, um, is a deep um, thinker uh, and that his diagnosis of what's wrong with modern life um, is much deeper than what he hoped to do in his brief time on Earth. But he also, I think, um, and it makes me think when I read about his, his politics, that he's, uh, he, he's more optimistic than um, the, the sort of deep pessimism uh, of thinking about the democratic social state would make one think. That is, you've got you to gotta start somewhere, and you have to counter the worst symptom um, in your society. Um, I, um, 
uh, in this paper, I quoted my uh, friend Harvey Mansfield, who in turn is quoting Pierre Manant, who is in turn making a comment on Montesquieu, um, who says that Tocqueville is the <coughs> is the um, is is interested in uh, particular facts, um, and he is the philosopher who leans on the authority of the moment. Um, so. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't think there's a I, I don't think there's a deep contradiction. Um, but if I think he thought he would be paralyzed if he um, uh, if he um, if he was in politics as a right as a philosopher and a writer. Josh, one of the virtues of democracy in America is that it deals with both these dimensions. Uh, but I will say. I think, you know, if you really have to press the matter, the 1835 volume seems mo a bit more concerned with the institutions. And then he sits up in his father's attic, the library, uh, in Normandy for, for a number of years and writes the second volume. And it's a deep, penetrating assessment of the internal workings of, uh, of the democratic soul. Um, I've taught Plato's Republic probably 80 times, and I'm always haunted by, by the question, so why when, I'll give the esoteric reading, why, when Plato writes the Republic, why is he always concerned about souls? I think his view is that you can have all the great governors and great institutions, but if there's a rot lurking in, in the souls of your people, all the great governance and institutions aren't gonna help you. And, and I look at America today, and as a panelist have said, a lot of those institutions aren't there, and, and I, I don't think it's enough, though I think it's important. Uh, to know the institutional history, and, and we certainly have resources to go back, for example, to understandings of federalism. But I don't think, as it were, philosophical arguments are gonna be compelling enough until we actually, in our own hearts, realize that this uh, kind of universalist aspiration of being cosmopolitan man, um, it, it's not working for us. And I think when we get to that point, then we'll be able to hear the resources of, say, the Federalists or a Tocqueville. But I think right now, as I tried to suggest to you, we're oscillating back and forth between two points which are utterly untenable, which is a kind of release from all the parochial bounds, and this is the, the universalism on the one hand, and then a, a, a self-construction which is utterly impervious to others, and we oscillate back and forth between these. I don't think we can get to understanding Tocqueville or the importance of federalism until we wrestle with that first. So uh, I want to say both are important, but I don't think we can hear the institutional piece until in our own hearts we realize there's something seriously wrong that we have to address. Why don't we do the poll next uh, time then? Uh, I think in some ways the opposite of that, although, uh, and, and uh, I don't mean that the awareness of the problem of existential homelessness uh, isn't vital. But it seems to me that, this, that, that one of the things that Tocqueville teaches, as Montesquieu had taught before him, is that institutions shape character, uh, and institutions shape psychology. So if we experience existential homelessness, if we experience anquietude, uh, it's partly due to the democratic social condition, which Tocqueville talks about at length, and partly because of the erosion of those institutions that used to give us a sense of home. Uh, one of the reasons I emphasize local self-government is that was government near your home in which you reached out to your neighbors. Uh, and you learned the, what Tocqueville calls the art of association. And very often what Americans did is instead of doing things through government, they did th things through civic associations. If you look around the country and look at the hospitals uh, in the older parts of the country, they were all built by private effort, by people pooling resources. Uh, schools were built by private effort. Uh, so th there's local self-government, there's civic association, but if, if you want to turn to the question of existential homelessness, I think the, the primary source of that is divorce. Uh, that leaves you very much alone. 
uh, and divorce is exceedingly common, and it's been made exceedingly easy uh, over the last 50 years. No fault divorce. Uh, okay, pa Patrick and then and, uh, Josh. I guess uh, uh, Paul had, uh, Paul Carice invited us here in part that he expected that we might disagree among each other, and I guess let me, uh, let me rise to the occasion. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's actually the case, uh, in Paul Ray's comments actually I think are very characteristic uh, expression of what I, I was alluding to, which is the conservative embrace of Tocqueville, particularly his very famous and rightly famous critique of the rise of the tutelary state. But what Paul at least didn't really mention in his uh, remarks is that Tocqueville precedes that analysis by describing that it's precisely the delinked self and the rise of this individuated humanity that democracy is likely to produce that will that actually set up the conditions of the rise of the tutelary state. When he describes this phenomenon, he says, I'm going to call it democratic despotism, but I'm having a hard time finding a name for it because it has never existed before. When one uses the language of despotism, the only analog that one could think of was the old form of despotism in which some strong-armed leader would suppress and seek to, you know, through violence and through force, to uh, suppress the liberties of a populace. And what he speaks of, particularly in, in chapter three of, of, of uh, part four of volume two, is that it's a precisely when uh, the kind of process of individuation that, that I was describing, what uh, Josh was describing, has advanced so far. The people will have nowhere else to turn. They will in some ways have created a condition of such great liberty that in this condition of liberation, they will turn increasingly to the state as the only sucker, as the only assistance that they can then find in this world of profound, individuated, equal liberty. And when Paul suggests that it's because of what happened in 1912 and the rise of the 17th Amendment and the administrative state, what we notice there is that this wasn't the, the sort of suppression of an, an oppression of, of an overarching and overweening administrative state. This was by an overwhelming supermajority that would have to have taken place to, to pass a constitutional amendment. I take in part what Tocqueville's engaged in is not merely an extended commentary on the Federalist, but also an extended correction on the Federalist. What we see in the psychology that animates our institutions, and Paul's quite right, that institutions shape souls, but let's face also the fact that our institutions are themselves shaped by a psychology. And what we discover in the Federalist is a psychology that fears citizens getting together. It actually uh, was designed in many ways with the intention of creating a polity of largely separated selves. I'll give you one example of this. In Federalist 55, one of my favorite passages and most revealing passages, uh, uh, Madison is talking about his concern. Uh, there's been a proposal by the Anti-Federalists to have a large legislature, right? to have a legislature that would be very uh, particularly a, a House of Representatives, that would be so large in number that we would know quite intimately our representative. You'd have relatively small districts, and therefore you'd have to have a large house. By the estimate of what was at least a proposed amendment to the Constitution that never passed, if, this, if the uh, percentage of the population equaled uh, the, 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 num the num number of representatives in this original uh, proposal, our House of Representatives would be something on the order of 6,000. Uh, people today. That's how close and intimate uh, the Anti-Federalists wanted the, the representatives to be, was to have a very, a very large House of Representatives. And Madison writes that this would be a terrible uh, uh, outcome, because when you get people together, they're irrational. Their passions manifest themselves. They become uncontrollable. And this is the line that I think is very revealing. He says, were every member of the Athenian assembly a Socrates? the Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. You could have everyone as reasonable and philosophic and reflective as Socrates, but put them together in the same room and they're a mob. They act out of passion and irrationality. And what Tocqueville writes, in writing in particular about his experience of traveling through New, through New England uh, townships in the 1830s, is that the opposite is the case. That when people come together in the public square and they deliberate together, 
through and in a kind of reason and deliberate, uh, in form of deliberation. He says, their reason is deepened, their passions are moderated, they come to have, as, as Josh also stressed, their sense of self is, in, uh, self is enlarged as a consequence of this. So I see Tocqueville in many ways as saying, the practice of Americans is better than their theory today. Okay, that's that. Okay. Did Josh, did you have yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm between Paul and Patrick in more ways than one, apparently. Uh, so I have some, some trust in federalism, uh, which is to say bringing life down to an embodied level. I think it's very important. But, but to Paul's uh, uh, point um, about institutions, so yeah, I, I agree with him that we, these institutions can shape. Uh, but I think we would also agree that when, when generative life and sex are separated, uh, you, you're going to have some problems with family. And why does that happen? Well, Tocqueville says, the li we come to think of ourselves in the democratic age not as living with respect to a, with, with a hundred year horizon, but living in the instantaneous now. And if that happens, and I think we're there, living in this instantaneous moment, how is it possible to, to relink um, generation and sex? So you've got to have a, a view of yourself as being part of a long chain of generations. So, I ask my students routinely at Georgetown, I say, well, how many of you this Friday night or this Saturday night are going to act with a view to what your grandparents would think of you and what your grandkids are going to think of you? Hmm. Well, that doesn't happen. So I don't think we're going to even get to the family piece if we're thinking of ourselves as living in this instantaneous moment. Um, religion. Uh, so we know that somehow religion is important, but, but the whole idea of fault and transgression have, has left the churches and become identity politics. So that even when we know there's something to this fault and transgression, it's now left the institutional forum, forum where it can be made sense of. Uh, we know we need to have face-to-face -face relations, and yet we're, we're addicted to Facebook, which is a species of substitutism, as you will, if you will. Um, so even when we know that we need to do the right thing, we oftentimes don't even know how to do this. And so let's say we need to go back to these institutions. Well, who has the authority to declare that you should read these great books. I teach great books. Uh, routinely, my students will say, well, why should I care what Plato said? I have my own opinions. Let me tell you what they are. <laughs> uh, and and you know, when you have that, when you're up against that, you're, you're in a really rough spot. So I agree that institutions are, gonna things, are the things that are going to be really important to us. But I've, as I've gotten older, uh, I have a kind of prodigal son view of the way things work out. So we're, we, we have a home, and, and we leave it. And then we go, we think we can do it, we think we're fine, we don't have to have our institutions in place, and we end up, things not going very well, and so we end up hanging out with the pigs, and we're eating pig corn. Uh, not human corn, so we're already, we're starving, and we're fe feasting on these, uh, these pig corn, and then we get to the point where we're not even living on the corn, we're living on the husks of corn. Very important. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to, to move away from our home, and we're gonna, it's gonna have to get really bad before we come back to the idea of what the family is. And I don't think you can impose this through authority. I think we're just gonna have to make a mess of it and then one day wake up and say, you know, this is just not working so well. And then I think we'll be able to hear what the wise people of the past have said for the first time. Cheryl, did you wanna jump in? Well, I just wanna say something about um, the institutional uh, view and I do agree with Paul. I think, um, I, I just think that that uh, Tocqueville never uh, thought, actually, that in the future you'd be able to recreate those um, institutions. Um, so what struck me in this focus on soft despotism and the thinking about institutions is the same time he was writing that passage, so moving in democracy in America, he says something in the parliament that's very, very similar. Um, he says, basically, um, if, um, if national political life, which is the only place he thinks um, is still alive in France, if national political life becomes completely extinguished because of your activities, then we will fall into this dystopian, uh, despotic future um, in which our children will not even um, understand um, what a citizen is. They, they won't have a model of a citizen, they'll never have seen one, and they won't care. Um, so the inst for him, the, institution of, uh, the institutions of the, of the legislature and, and what they needed to do were urgent. Um, and I do think that he thought that they uh, came first. Um, 
it also leads me to think when I read um, him in Parliament that in some ways when he's talking about local uh, life in the New England township, it is a social education more than a political education. And the social education is actually to teach people, um, and it's unique, uh, it's a combination of uh, religion um, and activity, um, which um, is that people learn how to take care of local matters, but they also need recognize, they, they learn with humility that they can't um, actually do everything. Um, so then they're inoculated against this view that they can um, change everything the way French revolutionaries are. And, and they're actually willing to leave things to their betters. Um, remember, Tocqueville is very much a fan of indirect election. He loves the Senate. Um, you know, he, 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 he says the American Senate is the kind of um, opposite of what we ha have become. Um, I don't know if he would think that now. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think institution, that institutional change is all he could think of to do. Before we turn to questions from the audience, since uh, Josh brought up education, I, if we had more time, uh, all of you in a, a way are making the case that to understand our current reality, our political reality and social reality, we do need to have contact with these older books, and those books in turn are reading still older books and thinkers and debates. So uh, our dilemma, of course, is that uh, Tocqueville predicted that education in America would increasingly focus on what was immediately useful in terms of employment and material <laughs> prosperity and, and the culture of in, in, in innovation. So now, uh, 160 years later, how do, how do we argue to communities and to students that it's, it's really important? How do we define that term important? It's urgent for you to have contact with a book like this and then the books that this author is, is struggling with and, and reading. And, and you have 90 seconds, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, what's, what's striking to me is that, uh, you know, we're living in this age in which our technological ability and knowledge and you know, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, is clearly, you know, constantly advancing, uh, constantly uh, moving forward. And yet our, our civic lives, I think all of us recognize, our civic lives is, is, a, is a kind of catastrophe. Our democracy is, uh, is imperiled. And it's, I think it's, it's no coincidence that this, these two phenomena are happening at exactly the same time where you see the displacement of the liberal arts in our, both our, uh, our, our lower uh, institutions, secondary institutions, as well as our universities in favor of a STEM, uh, uh, really emphasis on STEM disciplines. And I don't mean to denigrate the STEM disciplines, they're very important. But if we are a democracy in some form or another, then in education and liberty, that's what a liberal arts education is, is perhaps uh, the most vital form of education if we wish to maintain our civilization as a free society. Uh, the fact that we're not talking about this, the fact that our university administrators uh, are not talking about this, the fact that we as a people are not talking about this is one of the great you know, signs that we no longer even appreciate what the benefits and what the, what the great gift of a liberal education truly is. All right, we have about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, Microphones in the center. Um, two, two basic rules about the brief questions that you should ask. Please do keep it brief and, and make a question out of it, not just a, a statement. So microphone is open. If you want to, if you want to address it to a particular panelist or to the entire uh, panel. Uh, my question goes primarily to panelist Ray. And you listed six things as uh, sort of cures for an ailing liberal democracy. And among, uh, among things like decent decentralized administration and local self-government, you, man you mentioned like um, biblical adherence. And that sort of stands out to me as necessitating, um, like it seems metaphysical in nature rather than uh, something normative that society should aim for. So I was asking what in particular was special about um, like biblical adherence that would make it preferable to adherence to some other religion, or what if it's just the sort of values embodied within the Bible? Uh, it's both the values embodied in the Bible, which are often echoed in other religions, and one particular thing. The idea that man is made in the image and likeness of God, something shared by Jews and by Christians. That is the, there's two foundations for human equality. 
Uh, on the one hand, Machiavelli says, uh, someone who wants to found a republic must suppose every human being a rogue. So we're all equal in the fact of our, uh, the Christian would say, sinfulness, but our, uh, our wickedness. That's one way to look at it, and you get hops out of that. Uh, the other side, and it goes, you know, the first people to say that man, all men are by nature equal, were the church fathers. Um, De Doctrina Christiana by St. Augustine, for example, Lactantius before them. Um, the notion that we're made in the image and likeness of God means we have to live up to a certain standard. Uh, but it also means we have a certain dignity. Uh, and uh, we won't let people walk all over us because of that sense of our own importance. Uh, look, the foundation for civic agency is the conviction you can make a difference. Uh, that, that is formed through local self-government. It's formed through civic associations where you actually do make a difference. It's formed by the family, uh, where you're brought up and gradually liberated from tutelage and you take on responsibilities. Uh, my, uh, I have a daughter in college, and three or four years ago I went to a uh, moving up ceremony for the younger children. And I asked, she was a junior in high school, and I said, do you want to come? And she says, no. And I came back from it. She says, and I said, she said, what was it like? And I said, boring beyond belief. And then I looked at her and I said, I'm looking forward to the moving out ceremony. <laughs> and she said, not as much as I am. <laughs> Josh, let me, let me take, unless you have a, oh, no, no. let me take ahead, a, a different cut at this. So Tocqueville is very clear that, first of all, religion is eternal to the human being. Uh, he said, uh, the whole secularization theory, it's not going to work. He says this in 1840. Uh, but when you really press Tocqueville on, and what he means by religion. He does say some, something like the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church needs to trim its sails. But let's press him further. What does he really think that's in, in the religions that's so necessary? And I'm gonna say something somewhat controversial. I think Tocqueville's view of, uh, of human nature was that, here I'll say it, that it's basically bipolar. Manic depressive, that is to say we're prone to excesses. We're, we're prone to throw ourselves frantically into the world or, and to withdraw. And, and that allows you to understand the one thing that he really does say about religion and the religions that matter. That is to say, what, what he means by this is we have to have, uh, it's the two commandments. You have to love God and you have to love your neighbor. Well, how does that fit in with this larger psychological problem of bipolarity? Well, if we're throwing ourselves frantically in the world, we need to have the claim that God is highest to kind of calm us down. If we're depressed and pulled into ourselves, we need to have the injunction to love your neighbor. Uh, to pull us out of ourselves. So it turns out that the, the two great commandments fit with this psychological puzzle. But let me add one other thing. Tocqueville does wrestle with the question of whether they're, for lack of a better word, good, world, good religions or bad religions. And his argument is that the modern world produces this non-parsimonious condition where family logic is this, economic logic is this, political logic is this, and we live in a world that doesn't fit. And as I said, this is one of the reasons why we're fixed on finding unity, because we don't want to live with all the stuff that can't be put together. And so when it comes to the question of religion, he's very clear, and he's critical of Islam. We have to, be, we have to get this on the table. Uh, he's clear that you, the, the, there's two kinds of religions. One, which allows you to live in hope with the broken world, with the promise that the world will be redeemed at the end. And the other is a, wor a religion which allows you to completely escape from the brokenness of the world. And this is a kind of enchanted view. And his view was that Islam, it's very clear in this one paragraph, Islam has this problem. Now I want to be also clear on this. The modernizers of Islam are trying to wrestle with exactly this question. Can there be an Islam which is able to accommodate the non-parsimoniousness of the world? So I want you to think very carefully about, about the, the problem of modern life. It doesn't fit. And he thought religion was necessary to give us hope that notwithstanding that things don't fit, there's a promise at, at the end of time everything will be pulled together. Nick, I want to switch to the next question, yes. Um, I'd like to ask a question, and any are you free to take up on this, but I was, to draw back to last year's lecture series, it was all about uh, polarization within the academia. And, uh, so I was wondering what you all think the role of the academia's kind of gradual polarization and partisanship has a play in kind of the acceleration of this progress towards the kind of authoritarian state of equality, as you've kind of all mentioned. Um, what role do the professors play, the academics, the intellectuals, in our current civic disorder? 
I'll take it up. Go ahead, please. Well, uh, you know, one of one of uh, one of Tocqueville's more, um, I think, pressing and interesting chapters is a discussion of what he calls perfectibility. He says that that dem in democratic ages there will be this kind of keen belief in, and I think this is something that Josh is, is pointing to, that through our efforts, through our um, brilliance and genius, we can be constantly perfecting our condition. It's a kind of, it's a, uh, uh, an inversion in some ways of the biblical understanding that ultimately perfection comes outside of this time and outside of this place, that we take on the ability to do this. But he, he concludes this chapter with this really interesting uh, story. He says, uh, I, was at, I was down at the, the harbor uh, talking with a sailor why their boats are, uh, you know, are so kind of you know, not in great condition. He says, why, why would we invest a lot of money in constantly renovating and updating our boats when we know they're going to be outdated? In the next in the next year, right? this is why we you know we have this very brief attachment to whatever cell phone I happen to have because I know that next year there's going to be a new one produced that's going to uh, outstrip it. Now think what this does for education. Think what this does if your view is that education, anything that happened in the past, right, is is going to be uh, uh, superseded by something that lies in the future. This then transforms what education in some ways has always been which is in some ways that effort to win a kind of knowledge and wisdom about the world that we, as human beings, rely on lessons from the past. Right? We're not going to do it all ourselves. We're not mayflies. We're not always going to, you know, we're not going to alone by ourselves invent, you know, completely, like, let's imagine a world in which there's no beer and there's no bread and, and we're going to find these things out for ourselves, in which it's going to be your job to go out and find out which mushrooms are poisonous. Like, I don't want to live in that world. Right? I want a world in which other people have done those experiments, and other people have figured out how to make beer and bread. But in this world of perfectibility, in some ways, what, what we're left with is a world in which the past is always being superseded. And therefore, I think this gives really an understanding of why it is we don't have polarization in the universities. We have a kind of unanimity of view, right, which is a progressive view today in the university, that the past has and must be superseded and that perfection lies in our future. And it's those people who are, in particular, devoted to the great books, devoted to an examination, and indeed the idea of transmitting a kind of knowledge from the past into the future, who no longer are really given a place of pride within these institutions. So I think it's, uh, Tocqueville helps us to understand that a kind of internal dynamic within democracy itself will lead to a kind of transformation of education in just the way I think we, we see it taking place today. Hello. Thank you, uh, both of you, for coming to our classes uh, earlier and later this week. Uh, but my question is, I think you guys all do a fantastic job at diagnosing the problem and really going through both how Tocqueville analyzes it and how it expresses itself in the modern day. But my question is, what is an actualizable first step that the, I guess, university people here, such as myself, can take to maybe remedy the solution or problem? A very American question, yeah. you know. What's the practical? Let's get let's get to the bottom line. Let's get practical. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're all up here in one way or another defending federalism, but but let's be clear, or localism, <clears throat> with the understanding, and I think Cheryl's right, that there is a place for the national government. So we're not interested in tearing down the government. But I'm always interested. Uh, I mean, Tocqueville isn't. We need to be clear on this. He he really pushed back, I think, against this in the American context because he saw the energy that gets unleashed when you have localism. <clears throat> and what I hear today in, in, this, in, in your generation um, is, well, this is just impossible. We, we can't do this. It, it's all fixed. There's, there's a global system. There, hist history has, it's, it's unidirectional. And by the way, Tocqueville thought that these democratic historians, uh, it, historians in our day, and we can use race, class, and gender, we're talking about social groups, in his words, they teach us how to obey. <clears throat> because we're part of this larger schema, larger movement of history that can't be stopped. Um, so I, my students ask me this question all the time, and I say, look, there actually is an answer. And, and literally, every five minutes of the day, you have an opportunity to do the right thing, Tocqueville and Lee speaking. And let me explain. In so many instances in our lives, <clears throat> I'll, I'll bet a dozen times a day at least, you have an opportunity to look out to address the problem or look up to address the problem. So if you're in a dormitory and you get into some little tiff with somebody else's dorm room down the hall, you can go say, hey, let's sit down and talk about this. Or you can go to the dorm head. The biggest 
problem we face, in my view, is that we're scared to death to go outward. And then if we don't address that, all of the lovely philosophy that I, and I love it, make no mistake about it, my life is dedicated to it, but none of this will work if we have the habit of looking up. Tocqueville's always talking about the habits of thought in the democratic age. So looking out is incredibly difficult. One of the things that, that uh, give me one minute, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways to, to note the peculiarity of globalism and identity politics is that in both cases there's no risk. Oh, we'll hand it to the global managers, they're gonna save the planet. Selfie man, if, if somebody comes along and gives you, puts, posts something on your Facebook page, you just say, I'm not gonna bother, I defriend. So both of these nodes of existence that Tocqueville saw happening in 1835 are no risk nodes of existence. And the intermediary space between them is a zone of incredible risk. And that means put down your phones. I'm quite serious. Put down your phones, stop by somebody's house. When was the last time you just stopped by? We're not allowed to do that anymore. It's this choreography, this no risk choreography because we're frightened to death to meet each other face to face. That's the end of history that Tocqueville thought would, would, have, would, would we come to the no risk world, okay? That could be managed. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I, I had a little bit of a response. I think um, there's a lot of differences on this, uh, uh, on this panel, but one thing we all agree on um, is this kind of connection between the liberal arts and civic engagement. Um, which um, go together because how do you learn about great books? That's what we all spend our time teaching. You learn about great books, not in some big lecture. You learn about great books and how they can help you live your life in a small, some kind of small setting. Um, and so I would say in thinking about your university education, think about um, uh, that this is the one chance that you're gonna have in your life um, to be in small groups with other people and transform yourself. Um, you know, some, all of us have had these seminars where we're transformed as well as the people in the seminar are transformed. So I guess my one advice would be to take advantage of that and um, to, um, and you have a, a wonderful um, new initiative here that you can do it. Next question. Thank you. Yeah, my question is going to be pretty similar. I don't think it would be controversial to say that had, for example, Brexit, the decline of freedoms in Turkey, Euroscepticism in Hungary, Trump's election, all, all the others, all these other disruptive forces that this panel would be happening. Um, as I was listening, I was hoping to uh, find some kind of bright line or standard um, as we return to de Tocqueville. So in reading de Tocqueville deeply, can we apply him specifically to the disruptive um, foreign and domestic events of the past, say, five years, and see some kind of concrete thing that got triggered and actually use de Tocqueville as a model for those things? Uh, let me suggest that in different places, <laughs> looking at different specific places, you're going to get different answers. Um, uh, if you look, for example, at Europe, uh, there's a kind of centralization that's being resisted. Uh, they speak different languages, they have different cultures, they have different outlooks on things. And having open borders destroys all of that. So there's, there's a great battle going on in Europe uh, that isn't going to end, I think, unless the European institutions become a little more modest as a, as a common market, uh, it worked. Worked brilliantly. Uh, they, they became more prosperous. But the minute you try to abolish all of the particularities of a place with umpteen languages and different peoples and different traditions, you're gonna make trouble for yourself. And it's clear that the common currency has been a disaster, at least for those uh, in the Mediterranean. So what, is, what would Tocqueville have to say to that? Well, the answer is you can't centralize too much or, or the thing will blow up on you. But that's not quite the, what he would say to us. <laughs>
if you see what I mean. In other words, our problems may, there, there may be problems we share with other peoples. Undoubtedly, there are some. Um, but there are problems peculiar to our own society also. Just a footnote, he Tocqueville seems to admire the Federalist Party, so to speak. Uh, he actually also admires the work the Federalists says. It's a great work that should know, be known by statesmen of all uh, countries. But, but he, he clearly admires the, the spirit that's present in the critics of ratifying the Constitution who are concerned about too much centralization. So he's, he's, an, he's a, often interested in these kind of balances, um, not going too far with, with any one uh, principle. Josh, you want to? Uh, I'll be more controversial. Uh, so I think we're involved in a fateful struggle. It's a struggle about the standing of inheritance. And this struggle, one could argue, begins with the French Revolution. Uh, I, if I had time, I would show you that it's on the first page of Plato's Republic. But we don't have time. Uh, but I think for, the, for our purposes, it, it begins with the French Revolution. And Tocqueville sees this as a profound threat, uh, this movement toward universalism, which is the destruction of all inheritance. Burke becomes Burke in writing his reflections, in effect, defends inheritance, which is the basis of all conservatism. And the struggle right now around the globe, in America and in Europe, is the standing of our inheritance. And there's one thing I didn't get to say, which if I'd had another half an hour, I would. This business about identity politics is really important. Because what identity politics does is it points out the fault and transgression associated with our inheritance. And the trade-off, the only way you can find atonement from those transgressions is to renounce the nation. That's why identity politics and globalism also go together. And so the great question is, can you have inheritance at all? And I would say the left is pushing in one direction. The right sometimes, I think, pushes too far in the other direction and says, yes, we have this grand inheritance, but there's nothing wrong with it. But the whole history of human life, and here I'm an Augustinian to the core, the whole history of human life is the history of transgression. Some great things, but also transgression. And the great question of life is, can we find atonement for the various transgressions? In Europe right now, it's the battle about the transgressions of colonialism in the, in the two world wars. In America right now, it's about the standing of the Confederate monuments and the history of slavery. We don't know how to deal with transgression. And having removed the ability to think through this matter in religious terms, it's become only political, which means you're permanently stained or permanently an innocent victim, and you cannot build a society on that. And Nietzsche saw this, give me 30 seconds, Nietzsche saw this in the 1880s. He said Europe was gonna, Europe retained the Christian categories but without the Christian religion. So you've got fault and transgression, but no way to atone for it. And Nietzsche's answer, and this is the answer of the fault, far, far right, which I see when I'm lecturing in Europe, let's just forget about the whole thing. We don't care about colonialism. We don't care about racism. We don't care about the two world wars. And that's what's happening right now in the alt-right. So it's ultimately a profound religious crisis we're in the midst of right now. OK, I mean, let's let Patrick. I have always don't want to be in the position of following Josh. But, uh, uh, but before we depart, I think uh, to put one last uh, um, part of Tocqueville on the table that hasn't been discussed yet, he not only, of course, um, prophetically predicts and accurately predicts the rise of the centralized tutelary state. But in a very short and very suggestive chapter, which, which occurs right at the end of volume two, part two, he also uh, speculates whether there might be a new kind of aristocracy that might arise from the heart of democracy. And that from the very heart of this equality of conditions, in other words, this loosening of selves, this delinking of selves, he says it will be in particular through economic activity what he calls the kind of industrial class, that will separate itself through its wealth, through its position, through its attainment from the common and ordinary people. And you, know, you wish that he'd actually written a much longer chapter on mm. this very subject. But at the very end of that chapter, he says, democratic peoples must be very wary and very vigilant about this possibility. And it seems to me that since we're in a university, and since universities are today the places where what the equivalent of that industrial class is being born, that we have to be very wary and vigilant about our complicity in producing what is fundamentally a class apart from the broader population of the country that it seems to me underlies the great crisis uh, that seems to bring together all of these various uh, places that you, and times that you mentioned. 
Well, on that note, um, we, we should uh, end this marvelous discussion, but hope that you stay for a reception to continue it. Just give me just a, a few final uh, closing remarks uh, before we go to the reception. So uh, obviously the students here can get information outside about our courses, about our major and our minor, liberal education. Um, the next event in the series, uh, Polarization and Civil Disagreement, is on November 13th, just after the election. We have a post-election discussion between a Democratic analyst and a Republican analyst. So it'll be Kristen Soltis Anderson and Margie O'Mara, who together uh, produced the podcast called The Pollsters. Uh, thanks again to all our partners, Cronkite School, O'Connor College of Law, PBS. Thanks to our terrific events and public affairs team in Skettle, uh, led by Dr. Carol McNamara, uh, but also the great uh, team of uh, Ty and Catherine and Taylor, Gayla, Susan, Kim, our student workers. In particular for this event, uh, to thank two of our uh, younger faculty, our assistant professors, Zach German and Karen Taliaferro, who came up with the concept of this and persuaded these terrific uh, speakers to come join us today. Uh, finally, I, I hope you will stay for the reception and please join me one last uh, round of applause for Paul Ray, Cheryl Welch, Patrick Deneen, Josh Wilson.